now going to do the motor examination. And we're going to start with the motor examination of the upper limb, and then we'll move to the motor examination of the lower limb. But the important point is to keep in mind how it's all interconnected. So just to recap from a segment we did earlier on, the upper motor neuron lesion to, for example, the left arm, will start at the right motor cortex, come through the coronary areata, into the internal capsule, and run through the brain stem. Remember the mantra, midbrain, pons, medulla. Then the tract will cross over and run in the corticospinal tract to the cervical uh, area where it will synapse with the anterior horn cell. That is the pathway of the upper motor neuron. Lesions along that pathway will cause changes in that left arm in keeping with an upper motor neuron lesion. For example, uh, if it is upper motor neuron lesion, you'll have increased tone, increased reflexes, a positive Hoffman sign, but no wasting of reciculations. Similarly, the lower motor neuron starts from the same from the anterior horn cell point and it will come out through the intervertebral foramen, go through the brachial plexus and run down the arm <clears throat> to its muscle of interest, to the neuromuscular junction. Thus, the lesion along that pathway will cause lower motor neuron signs, wasting, fasciculations, loss of reflexes and uh, negative Hoffman's and loss of power. So, in terms of approaching the motor examination of the upper limb, the first thing you must do is observe, as always. Muscles must be observed at rest, and you're looking for wasting and fasciculations. So it's worthwhile taking a small step back to see if there's symmetry at the level of the shoulders, at the level of the biceps, and at the level of the hands, and then turn the hands over. And it just reminds you to look for small muscle wasting in the hands, which can often come up in clinical exams in particular. Thank you very much. The next thing I want to do is look for wasting and fasciculations in each muscle group, because sometimes they can be quite subtle. So I usually give a little tap more to remind myself than anything else. I don't think it really has much physiological function. But it reminds me to look at all, muscles group, all muscle groups, particularly in conditions such as motor neuron disease. And motor neuron disease, as you know, is a combination of upper and lower motor neuron signs in all four limbs with no sensory signs. Once I've done the observation and found no wasting of fasciculations, I move on to tone. Now, people tend to come at tone in a little bit of a haphazard manner, so I always recommend a bit of organization. So, can I just take your hand if you don't mind, David? Now, I'm going to bend David's arm up and down at the elbow. This is very simple. Up and down at the elbow, flexion extension. And I'm thinking about lead pipe rigidity in Parkinson's. I'm then going to move my hand down and bend it up and down at the wrist. I'm now thinking of cogwheel rigidity in Parkinsonism, or extrapyramidal disorders. Then I'm going to do a more subtle sign, is moving from pronation to supination. And I'm going to do it quickly. And sometimes in upper motor neuron or corticospinal tract damage, you get a catch called a pronator catch. In other words, when I go from here to here, it'll go like that. So clasp my fragility, which is pull and then release, and a pronator catch is pyramidal tract problem, and lead pipe rigidity at the elbow and cogwheel rigidity at the wrist is a, an extra pyramidal or Parkinsonian type problem, if you will. And then if the tone is generally non-specifically increased, think about paratonia or Gegenhalten which is a frontal lobe problem in which the brain knows what it wants to do but can't connect necessarily to relax the muscles when instructed to do so. The next thing I would do then is after checking tone in each arm, uh, I would then go for power. I tend to examine power together and try and minimize the stress on myself and also on the, most importantly on the patient. So the first thing I do is ask the patient to put their arms up like wings if you will and test shoulder abduction. So if you could push up as high as you can against my pressure. Push hard. And the natural thing now is for the patient to want to put their arms down. So I slip my hands under and now test abduction. Bring them down. And the natural thing is to continue that path. So I ask them to hold their hands up. And one at a time I test elbow uh, flexion. Can you pull me towards you? And then push me away. Push hard. Thank you. And then I do the other side. Pull me towards you and push me away. Again, the natural thing is to extend one's hands. And I want you to cock up the wrists and keep them bent, cocked up like that. Intending wrist extension, C6, and put your hands out straight, and then I test finger extension. Keep them up and keep them up. I always turn the patient over and ask them to test grip, small muscles of the hand. Squeeze as tightly as you can, reminding them not to twist. Thank you, that's fine. And then I test the small muscles of the hand. You can rest your hands down there. Uh, the interossei. Now remember that the fulcrum around, every, around which everything happens in the hand is the middle finger. First is the thumb, second is the third finger, F3 we call it. And it's for a dermatomal point of view, when we come to sensory later, it's C7. But from a muscular point of view, motor point of view, it's around which movements are either away from, 
C7 or from the middle finger, or they're towards it. So everything happens towards and away. So hence the reason if we say the dorsal interossei, you all remember, uh, abduct, we'll say, dors we'll, we'll test that by saying, can you spread your fingers wide? And the dorsal interossei are abducting away from the middle finger. So keep them apart and don't let me push them together. Keep them apart, hard as you can now. Fabulous, okay, that's fine. The palmar interossei adduct towards that same finger, and you test that with a piece of paper. And I put it in the middle here between third and fourth, so thus with his right hand, must use the same hand at the same level. It's not fair to cheat and start doing this. To do the same in, in the first space, I must do the same here. And if I move to the left hand, don't forget to move to your own left hand and compete fairly. Okay. One of the uh, good tips for examining the nerves of the hand is, if I could just turn you over here, is to put your thumb in line with the index finger like that. Can you do that for me, David? Okay. And remember, everything's abduct going to or from, in terms of instructions, this finger. So for the median nerve, for example, it supplies abductor away, pollicis of the thumb. So I'd ask you to lift your thumb up and touch my finger and push hard. That's abductor pollicis, thus a quick way of testing for the median nerve. For the ulnar nerve, it supplies adductor towards pollicis. So if you bring your thumb in that way, test that, and that's ulnar nerve tested. And for the radial nerve, it tests extensor pollicis. And if you could bring your hand right up like that, as if you're hitching a lift, and you can see the tendon there, keep it up hard, and that's the radial nerve. Thanks. So that's the first part is observation, then tone, then power, and then you do coordination. Can you put your hands out in front of you? and turn the hands up to the sky and close your eyes just for a second. Always remember to check drift. Sometimes a cortical lesion, say for example on the left, will lead, I'm gonna to touch your hand now, will lead to a drift over or up of one side rather than the other. But just a rough guide while you're testing coordination. Can you open your eyes now? I'm gonna to touch one of your fingers. I want you to touch your nose with this index finger and then touch my finger. And back and forth as quick as you can. I will change my finger's position. But only, as you notice, in depth, not from side to side. This is a test of depth perception. And what I'm looking for is, if I just slow you down there, David, as he comes towards me, I'm looking for intention tremor and pass pointing. So don't be doing this all over the place. You go from one side to the other like that. So you're looking for pass pointing and intention tremor, and of course, in coordination, usually signs of a cerebellar problem. And then you do dysdiadocokinesia, which is to put your right hand on top of your left, and then turn it over like that, and then back again. And gradually speed that up as quick as you can. And some people will end up all over the place like that. That's great. And then you swap from one hand to the other for coordination. That's perfect. Thanks a million. So after tone, power, coordination, you do the reflexes. And these are the things you'll be asked most about on exams and really are the most helpful in localizing terms. Now, you've got to step back again and think about this before you do it because the reflexes come, the, the nerves that make up the reflex arcs come through, uh, come from and go back to the spinal cord. So you must start at the top and work your way down. There's no point in doing a C5-6 and then an L5-S1 uh, reflex. It doesn't connect. So you do each reflex in time as you come down, metaphorically come down the cervical spine. You keep, you keep everything as, as close to right angles as you can. You use the full length of the tendon hammer where possible. Um, a lot of people fall into the trap of starting to tap people like this. They do so very tentatively like this. And then they start feeling for tendons that they know they have had for years themselves. So bizarre behavior under the pressure of an exam. Avoid that by practicing a bit more in advance. So we're going to do side to side. Never cross your hands. And you go from biceps to supinator to triceps to finger flexors to Hoffman's. So as you'll see here, I come down to the biceps. I extend my thumb. And I take the full length of the, and, and I'm look, the, full length of the tendon hammer. And I'm looking at the biceps tendon here. And you can see it contracting there and that's fine. Then I lean across, and I ask to make the right angle again. Try not to hit the patient. And you can see, just inside there, the biceps contracting away. So that's C5-6 working well. Then I come down to the supinator, just on the edge of the uh, um, wrist. And you can see the muscle group here, working away, and the same again here. And this is C6-7. Even still, I repeat them as I go down reflexes every time because I always forget. Now I make another right arm, right angle here for the triceps. This time, unlike the first two, you don't cover the tendon, but you observe the triceps muscle here, and then you do the same on the opposite side. Make plenty of room so you notice I'm not all over the patient or impinging on them too much, I hope. 
And you can see that fairly clearly contracting here. If you can't, you reinforce in the upper limb as follows. You go, I ask you to grit your teeth when I say now. Okay, so this primes the muscle spindles. So when I say now, I want to say one, two, three, now. And it might bring out the reflexes you're having trouble getting. Finally, if I could take your hand, if you don't mind, you do the finger flexors. So C5, 6, C6, 7, C7, 8, now C8, T1. So I put my hands in his palm and ask him to drop his fingers down like a weeping willow tree. I'm going to give a good thump onto my own hand. And you can see the fingers flexing here. And that's C8, T1. And you finish the examination by doing the equivalent, if you like, of the Babinski or plantar response in the hand is Hoffman's sign. So you take the patient's hand, you come to the first, second, to the third finger, again, everything happening through here. You take the uh, proximal, middle, and then the distal, proximal, middle, distal uh, phalanx, uh, part of the phalanx, joint, and you grab it so that you flick extremely hard. What you're doing here is you're flicking the finger hard and looking for opposition, op opponents to work, so for the thumb to come in. So you're looking for opposition of the thumb. And a positive Hoffman sign would be if I mimic it here, do this, and the thumb flicks in like that. So that's tone, power, coordination, and reflexes finishing with Hoffman's. And that, in essence, is motor examination of the upper limb.